The price, my kind of rage is the kind that shouldn't be dealt with by anyone. It is not good to feel the desire to take another person's life out of rage of any kind. Right now, I wanted to break up with two people, and once I announced my presence, I realized I would need to be very careful to avoid going to jail. Why am I feeling so irate? I will explain why. My wife began to transform like a chameleon before my very eyes approximately five weeks ago, and that's when it all began. She used to be very sweet and loving toward me, but now she cuts and belittles me. She started to object to intimacy, which included sharing bedtime rituals with her spouse. That immediately raised my suspicions because I had cheated on a partner in the past and had to learn some unpleasant life lessons as a result. I never brought up the first woman in my life to the woman I am with now. I doubt it would have mattered in any case. I made the decision to look into it more during the second week of her change. I'm not the type of guy that goes to a pie or anybody else for help solving his problems. Nope. Thank you very lot. I'm one of those people that likes to get his hands dirty and take care of my own problems. At midday, I went with her from her job. I knew she was cheating on me when she parked her car in the motel lot and rapidly made her way to room 104. Dealing with consumers outside of the workplace was not at all part of her job description. In actuality, since she worked in the record-keeping department, she rarely interacted with consumers. I was hurt by that first discovery, but not quite as much as I had been hurt by her jokes, scratches, and slights. She met a man who was one of her co-workers. He was somewhat of a separate department employee. I had heard he was climbing the ladder quickly and that he was in the swift ascending circle. I made up my mind on how I was going to handle this issue after witnessing them meet three times in two weeks. Directly, I waited until now, knowing that my wife was in the embraces of another man right beyond this door, since I'm too cheap to spend good money on an already established factor. I kept telling myself, I won't end them, I won't end them, hoping that would keep them from ending. It was going to be quite tight. It was imperative that I face them and obtain the photos. I could still file a lawsuit in this state for alienation of affection, and her employer would also be held liable for allowing it to go as it did. I assumed that Mr. On the Way Up would soon find himself on the way out. I had to serve the divorce papers to the soon-to-be ex-wife after getting the images. I had paid the locksmith just before I left, and as I waited here, the locks on our house were being replaced. I had divided up all of our money equally and transferred it around. I had cancelled every credit card we had. After two weeks of doing a lot of things, the last upheaval was ready to start. I wonder how Simone will take it. I believe she will be pleased rather than angry. But, after a few minutes, she can also experience intense guilt. Naturally, my highly experienced divorce lawyer informed me that the guilt would subside as soon as she retained legal counsel. You could wonder if I love her. Well, I despise her openly and completely right now. Simultaneously, I'm having a serious internal conflict with myself because I believe she truly loves me and that this is just an error on her behalf. Bad judgment, and we could make things right. Though logically, I know it won't occur. I would never accept a wife who betrays me. I no longer have any faith left in her at all. The part of me that still loves her hasn't had time to adjust to this abrupt and total transformation that has occurred in such a short period of time. I was given the room key by the motel management. The gateway to obtaining the key was a $100 note and an assurance not to damage the location. He seems like a good man, and I'm sure it's not his fault that my wife and her toy boy decided to have their trysts here. In addition, he talked about how we had some things in common with his ex-wife. Slow motion, after inserting the key, I softly unlocked the door. As I enter the room, I shut the door nearly completely, leaving a small gap. I took full aim with the camera and entered the room. Man I love this digital camera. I pondered in my mind. I'm sure glad she gave it to me for my birthday three months ago. She had been yelling at the man. While he was doing the foolish thing, Simone was crying and attempting to hide it. I'd been hoping in secret that he would, so his decision made my next move very obvious. How absurd is that? You are who you are. Before I kick your butt, leave now. She is my soon-to-be ex. It's up for debate who gets kicked in the butt. You won't likely kick my behind, in my opinion. He stepped closer, and I shifted to one side. I let him approach on my left after putting the camera down and slightly rotating to the right. I released the camera and spun quickly, throwing my arm up in a forceful swing. My fist nearly made contact with his jaw. With all of my hurt, rage, and a hint of dread, his feet rose off the ground. You speak about fear. Indeed, fear. He was just not worth it, and I was worried I was going to break up with him. He collapsed on the ground. I was probably more irate than I realized. I knelt to feel for a pulse in him. I relaxed since I could feel a pulse. I turned to face Simone after hearing her go on and on about something. With terror in her voice, she abruptly stopped talking. I realized that I must have looked very different from the man she had left at breakfast this morning, and that she had never seen me like this before. Well, lady, I hope you relish this piece of trash. From now on, he will be yours. I most definitely don't want to interact with your infidelity anymore. She sat there, trembling and giving herself a hug while tears streamed down her cheeks. She seemed unable to look me in the eye, which is something I've observed happening more often lately. 
but now she was aware that I was aware. She realized now that the game was over. She shivered as I stood over her lover and she gave me a quick glance. But her gaze did not linger on me for very long. These are the standard documents that are provided in circumstances such as these. I have filed for divorce. The home's locks have been replaced. I've deposited your part of everything into a bank account. We're done, you're served, no need to thank us. Her knees, partially exposed from the sheet she was attempting to conceal herself under, were hit by the papers. After glancing at them, she met my eyes directly. She remained silent. I felt nothing for the first time in the past three or four weeks. There were two kind of nothing happening in the room. She realized there was nothing she could say right now to patch things up between us, even if mine was going to be far more terrible in the end. I even had the impression that we hadn't existed for longer than these past few weeks, and that she might not even know how to put things right. Hearing her pleading with me as I turned to leave, I left through the door. Hold on. Allow me to clarify. Jonathan, please. Ideally, please. I carried on moving. At that moment, I couldn't allow her to see my eyes. They were stuffed. Tears were streaming down their faces, and I knew that if I looked away, my entire scheme would come apart. I didn't want to do that since there was too much water under the bridge and I was too busy right now. There was no more to what had previously been. When I got home, the locksmith was waiting amiably. In addition to reprogramming the garage door opener, he had changed all three of the access locks. I gave him a $20 gratuity and thanked him for taking on the task at such short notice. I sat at the kitchen table inside the house that had once been a home, remembering the years we had spent together. I had no idea why Simone had suddenly altered her mind and thought less of me than she had obviously thought. I was completely clueless as to why she had taken this action. I was aware that our time was up. I was aware that the suffering and the words had transformed me into a different man in just five weeks, but Simone had evidently missed the changes in me as well as the changes in her throughout that time. The telephone rang. Observing the caller ID, I recognized Simone's mother. I responded, John, what's happening? With tears in her eyes, Simone walked over here and said she had ruined your marriage. What took place? Well, Doris, this is how it is. I discovered Simone at a hotel room today and served her with the divorce papers. She will have to tell you the rest of the story. John, why? I have no idea what this means. Look, Doris, I truly apologize. You are aware of my unwavering love for you and Sam, and how difficult this whole situation is for us all. However, it must be, in this manner. Now tears were streaming down my cheeks. I genuinely cherished Simone's parents. Over the years that Simone and I had been together, they had been incredibly kind to me, so hearing Doris express her anguish and perplexity broke my heart. That this was happening over the phone pleased me. This was not how I wanted people to see me. John, can't you two work it out somehow? Doris, I don't think so. This is quite significant. An enormously significant event that has the potential to devastate everything. I could tell by the stillness on the other end of the line that Doris was struggling to process the sudden and harsh news. I felt sorry for her because Simone had been acting terribly romantic in front of her parents during our supper with Doris and Sam the night before. I had been surprised by the whole show. We had a disagreement en route, and naturally, I received the cold shoulder on the way back. But we'd made the ideal little couple while we were staying with Doris and Sam. Sam was saddened by his daughter's behavior, so I didn't let our disagreement show, but it seems like I should have warned them in some way before acting as I did. Sam's health was not great, and his years of hard labor and smoking had contributed to his current state of poor health. I felt horrible for not alerting Doris and Sam to all this chaos, even though she was in wonderful health and always worried about Sam. However, I knew that if I had told them, Simone would have received some sort of warning and I would never have been able to obtain the necessary images. Well, unless her attorney gave us a hard time, I didn't really need them for court. Her attorney threatened to put the photos on the table with six sworn statements about their affair if she gave in to the pressure. I refer to it as a reserved affair. I don't know if Simone was genuinely in love with this guy or even if she had first agreed to join voluntarily. Greg's coworker had made a sworn statement claiming that he had something against Simone's head from the beginning of the whole affair. With Simone's employer facing the case, my lawyer was in his element. As I was getting ready to check into the motel room this morning, that case had been brought and filed. After filing in court, he spoke with the company's lawyers over the phone in less than 20 minutes. To be honest, they were ecstatic. Naturally, they were likewise in denial, but when he brought up the sworn affidavits, the company's perspective completely changed. My lawyer informed me that, absent a valid justification for their actions, Simone, her lover, and any other parties implicated would most certainly lose their employment the next day. Me, I was aware that Greg's employer's conduct made a compelling case for alienation of affection. Three of his and one of her co-workers had given us sworn affidavits about them skulking around the office and having it on. Supervisors at the workplace had also made assumptions about them, but no one addressed any of us. We also got sworn statements from the cleaning lady and the motel owner. There were six witnesses in total, together with my photos, to confirm that there were, in fact, liaisons taking on during business hours. They had decided to stay at the motel to avoid their co-workers' stares. 
Clearly, Greg had realized that they were becoming too obvious. He was also aware of the policies of the organization about workplace romance. My attorney had obtained numerous details. We also had a printed copy of their company policy about relationships, behavior, and ethics at work. By the time I realized something wasn't right, I found out Simone and the jerk had been dating for a little over five weeks. By the time I went to see them at the motel, Simone had been chasing me about for a little more than ten weeks in total. This had been one of those most terrible moments in my life, the five weeks before I found out. I hoped that, as long as I lived, I wouldn't have another one after having the first three. The Simone rendition of the history. Our relationship wasn't as strong as it had been when we were first married. Jonathan had been occupied with multiple projects at work. Since it was interfering so much with our personal life, we had discussed it. I was confident that my efforts would be rewarded in the coming months with a well-deserved promotion. Greg discovered that I had made mistakes in certain employee records at my place of employment. Though not a major mistake, it was a serious one that could have prevented me from getting my next promotion and increase and put me on the back burner for the foreseeable future. Greg utilized that information to practically blackmail me into meeting him for lunch one day, being the kind of man that he is. That worked out to be a favor once, sparing me the pain of having to deal with all the fallout from my error. Though I'm not happy about it all, the one thing that let me do this was that Jonathan and I hadn't been spending much time together or getting along for the past six months. Before Greg and I met for the first time, I had been feeling as though I was losing out on some of the experiences that other people had had in life. My one and only had been Jonathan. I had never, ever been with any other man but him. Being with Greg had caused a deep-seated dam to burst inside of me. We had our first lunch together in Greg's workplace. As usual, everyone went, but I stayed behind. Greg had brought in some cheese and crackers and a tiny bottle of my favorite wine, and he was waiting for me. During our hour-long lunch breaks, we would all go to nearby eateries or buy food from street vendors. Usually, I would visit the street seller, quickly get something from the cart, and then head to the park to spend some alone time. On that first day, we were hardly missed at all. Greg had shown to be a more amiable person than I had initially believed. I also kind of had to let go the first time. I realized that day that I desired it even more. I knew it was wrong, though. Greg treated me like, even though I still loved my spouse. I'm not sure. Perhaps his property or a similar term. I could absolutely let go and be someone else when I was with him. He would give me instructions, and initially, even though I wasn't happy about it, I would follow them. I had done things with Greg by the conclusion of that lunch that I had never done with my husband. I had felt less resentment towards him when I had left his office, having barely had time to sort things out before the others returned. As I tasted him on my lips later that day, I couldn't help but wonder about when I would see him again. It was an unexpected, sudden notion, and it let me know that I want Greg once more. Greg also desired more than one instance. The following day, he confronted me about it, and we again did the office thing. That day, I overheard him start talking negatively about Jonathan. Negative tiny slights. I never gave what he was saying any real thought. Over the course of the following two weeks, a pattern began to emerge. Greg would criticize Jonathan as we were working on it. He even suggested that Jonathan must be having an affair with me. Given the state of affairs in our household, I quickly adopted Greg's outlook. I began to denigrate and criticize Jonathan over the course of the weeks, with the exception of my parents. When my parents were around, I attempted to be the obedient, loving little wife because I was afraid they would see right through me. Thus, just prior to the hotel trysts developing, Greg and I had progressed from a lighthearted encounter to a fully-fledged romance. Jonathan and I were no longer together. Greg had suggested that our meetings should continue at the motel until we could come up with another plan. Considering that we worked in different sectors, he thought it was possible that someone at work had told his wife that we appeared to be together a bit too often, since she was growing suspicious. We had never discussed divorcing our partners. It was never mentioned. We were just getting together for a good time, and it seemed to get hotter the more we got together. Before Jonathan revealed that he knew about us, Greg had begun to discuss the possibility of introducing another man. I was hesitant at first, but after his inspiring speech, I started to wonder what it would be like. If Jonathan hadn't done what he had, I most likely would have dated multiple men in less than a month. I'd never even considered letting Jonathan do anything with me, but Greg seemed to know just what to say and how to act to persuade me to do things with and for him. I ought to have realized that Jonathan and I were in love. Love, courtesy, and comprehension. That's what I gave up to Bond, along with passion. I gave it up to Greg with little or no resistance once he placed his order and took what he desired. Jonathan had shown me respect and had never taken anything without getting my full consent. Greg had no affection for me, so he could take from me and order me. While his wife provided the necessary emotional support, he was all alone with this little woman from whom he could obtain anything. However, I had taken Greg's jokes about Jonathan personally and stopped supporting my husband emotionally so that I could experience the high I was getting from him. Ten weeks ago, I made the biggest mistake of my life, and looking back, I realized there is no turning back. The last time Jonathan and I had what I would consider a great time is still fresh in my mind. 
We had dinner at my folks' house. After a few weeks away on vacation, mom and dad returned with an infectious amount of love and joy. I'd always wanted to take advantage of Jonathan, but he would generally stop me before he could, wanting to give me more pleasure while he was still able to. He had been tenderly caressing me that evening when all of a sudden he turned into a tiger. In the true sense, he moved with a hardness I had never seen in him before, it wasn't overly violent, but it was enough to drive me insane. We'd had the nicest time ever, and now when I look back on it, at least I had that recollection clear of Greg and my subsequent behavior. That night, we had spent hours having fun, almost into the next morning. I spooned up to my hubby, knowing that he genuinely wanted me and loved me. After a few weeks, I had finally caught up with Greg and his blackmail. I'm still not sure how I took that initial step in the manner that I did. I asked myself, how had I been so damned easy? And why would I allow my job and my fears of moving up come between my husband and me? In addition to why didn't I fight Greg and push him to reveal what he allegedly had on me? Looking back, I really wish I had made more effort to get Jonathan to try new things, and I wish I had been my husband's filthy lady rather than some jerk like Greg. Not that I ever really loved the guy, but I adored Jonathan on the other hand. I had briefly fallen out of love, as is common in marriages. Rather of persevering, I had chosen the simple route and discovered pleasure in the company of another guy. The fact that I have to put up with the brand cheater hurts the most. That's who I am now, that's my identity. Once a cheater, always a cheater is a saying I've heard. I live with the knowledge that I am a liar now. I was taken aback when Jonathan entered the room that day. I made an effort to blend in. I attempted to dislodge Greg. When Greg finally stood up, I noticed a stranger when I glanced in my husband's face. I had never seen such a sight in his eyes before. As soon as Jonathan began taking our photos, Greg got off of me. With a statement I missed, Greg got from the bed, and Jonathan turned calmly to place the digital camera on the table next to him. I was shocked for the next few seconds. I watched Greg move to intimidate Jonathan. The next thing I saw was Greg take off and fly up about two feet before collapsing onto his back and passing out. Just as Greg appeared to jump into the air, as if he were sprouting wings, I heard the sound of something hitting flesh. When I looked back from Greg to Jonathan, I noticed that he had some blood spattered on him and was holding his fist closed. I was unable to look at Jonathan once his icy blue eyes met mine. Burrowing into the sheet, I attempted to hide. Jonathan threw some folded papers on the bed and called me a disgusting woman. I've heard of papers being served, divorce, and stuff like that. I glanced at the bed linens, uncertain whether my spouse would take any action or not. I felt afraid, frightened, and most of all, ashamed. Jonathan took the camera from the table, turned abruptly, and began to walk out. I called out to him. Though I can't recall what I said, I do recall thinking that it must have sounded so hollow. I then had a lengthy shower. I never gave Greg a call. I didn't give a damn if he was finished. The motel manager stopped by to see how the room was doing. At that point, I discovered that Jonathan had purchased a key from him. That manager gave me a dirty look. He claimed that the only true reason he'd given Jonathan the key was because he'd seen his wife with another man in a room similar to Jonathan. He told me that I had made a big mistake. He didn't have to inform me. I was aware. I had just thrown away the greatest thing I had ever known. All because I became engrossed in my little romance and believed I was unique. When I arrived at work the next day, three men were waiting for me in my office. The CEO, the HR manager, and a man who appeared to be the business attorney. Someone wondered how Greg and I had connected. I gave a thorough explanation. I didn't hold anything back. I knew I would be leaving by the end of the day since I could see the identical expressions on my coworkers' faces as they passed the office that morning. But I was mistaken in that regard. The HR representative first confirmed that my initial meeting with Greg was a kind of blackmail, and then they had me sign various documents pertaining to Greg and myself. Before noon, I was out of the office and walking the streets. The company refused to let me work there, but they were forced to pay me severance because Greg had initially blackmailed me. I was out other than that. Building security accompanied Greg outside, where he was immediately apprehended by law enforcement. He had been involved in other activities, and it became apparent when he was questioned. Greg was in a really deep hole. Later on, I discovered that Greg had been occasionally stealing from the company. Usually, it involved modest sums of money or some quick work on travel-related receipts. Combined, the evidence was sufficient to accuse him of grand larceny. After leaving him with their three children, Greg's wife moved back east to live with her parents. Greg was detained pending his trial. Originally, I was requested to testify, but after speaking with the DA, she concluded that my testimony would likely cause more harm than good, so they opted not to utilize me. I was invited to testify on Greg's behalf by his attorney. He also concluded that I would not be useful on the witness after I told him what I would say about how Greg had first used extortion to force me to bond and then how he had pushed a wedge between my husband and myself. I returned home. That hurt a lot. As I arrived, my dad was on the verge of having a heart attack. He was furious, as angry as I had ever seen him. He called me a lot of derogatory names. He was baffled as to why I had thrown away my marriage to Jonathan in the manner that I had. Mom hurt the worst of all. 
She met my gaze, her eyes brimming with anguish. Her remarks will always be embedded in my memory. This is the worst thing you could have done in your life. You have disappointed not just your parents and yourself, but also your spouse. You have completely wrecked your husband's love and two marriages, young lady. Minimal, you descended to the lowest level possible. Since you are my daughter, I still love you, but my respect for you has completely vanished. It hasn't been easy since then. It's tough to live alone, not of a job, and live with parents who have drastically altered as a result of my behavior. The money was divided evenly after Jonathan kept his commitment. I gave up ownership of our house, and he sold it right away. Right now, I'm figuring things out in my life. I regret going where I did, and I miss my hubby. Yes, I am aware. Too little, too late. It will take a long time, if ever, to get rid of that cheater brand that hangs over me. But I'm starting over. I'm hoping that eventually I'll be able to move on from this pain and stop experiencing it hourly. Jonathan relocated across the nation and resigned his work. I believe he was too sick to bear the idea of his adulterous wife being in the same situation as him. I hope that I have learned a painful lesson. We'll find out in time. Jonathan concludes it was the finest feeling I had ever had to leave the motel room that day. Greg was still unconscious, and Simone was still sobbing on the bed. I went outside into the corridor to meet the motel manager. I gave the key to him. He gently rested his hand on my shoulder. Though difficult now, things will improve. Go on, discover who you are, and then discover someone else. You'll be alright. It will hurt for a while yet, I won't lie to you. It depends on your level of affection and concern for her. I'm grateful. That part I worked out on my own, but it's comforting to hear from someone who has been there. I'll see you around. No offense, but I hope not. I turned to leave. That evening, at home, I sobbed. I am aware that this isn't considered macho or manly. However, I hurt. I received a call from Doris informing me that Simone was allowed to move in with her and Sam. She sounded disoriented. I started crying when I read that. I felt horrible for them because they were wonderful people who had been entangled in this situation. Simone didn't dispute anything regarding the divorce for several days. Everything went as smoothly as silk. I believe my lawyer was as astonished as I was. She was completely out of fight. She was obviously in pain, but at least she didn't try to justify her actions. The lawsuit against her previous employer was resolved after the divorce. Their only desire was for me to go, and they were prepared to cover my legal fees, court charges, and a substantial amount to ensure that I did. Greg was arrested. For now, that was something I enjoyed. He would now experience other types of bonding, ideally on the receiving end this time. I don't feel sorry for him. To me, at least, he's nothing and not a man. He had a wife and three children. During the chaos of the divorce, I had met her once. She was also an observer. How pathetic Greg was. He had everything and threw it away due to an unidentified excitement he thought he was missing from her. I sent my letter of resignation. My employers were taken aback. They did a great job trying to talk me out of leaving, but I was just too troubled to be a productive employee there. After they realized I was gone, they offered me a lovely letter of recommendation, which I accepted. They did what they could. I'm working on the West Coast at a new job. This is where I moved approximately a year ago. I got to know a kind young woman. She is truly a keeper. We share a common ground. Her ex-husband cheated on her, but I'm still a little hesitant to put my trust in her. Regarding our bonding, you may be interested in knowing. We've completed everything and then some. Like her, I love to go on adventures. I want to make sure that in that department, we are both as content as we can be in the long run. We complement one other in other areas as well, so our partnership is well-rounded. Since the divorce, I've dated a little bit, so I can recognize quality when I see it. I hope she thinks the same thing of me. Life has served as a wake-up call, but I believe things are improving. My comment, I don't think people that cheat realize they have a personality change that is picked up by their spouse. Yes, some may be able to mask it. You agree? Comment down below, sub and bell and I will catch you in the next story.